Welcome everyone um, to our exciting um, keynote address for our conference today on migration. Um, and uh, my name, for those of you who were here all day, first of all, thank you for being here all day. And second, I apologize for reintroducing everything that I've already done today, uh, but there are new people and there are certainly new people out in the web audience. <clears throat> So my name is Jamal Ilyas. I am the director of the Wolf Humanity Center, um, which is Penn's Humanity Center. Uh, and it, uh, our, we do all kinds of programming and we tend to do it uh, uh, based around a annual theme. And the annual theme for this year has been migration and it's been a wonderful, diverse and continues to be rich uh, topic that we've explored in public lectures, concerts, uh, panel discussions, uh, and, and presentations such as the one we're going to be uh, viewing today. Um, uh, let me just again, uh, because it's not just us that's involved in doing this, we have several co-sponsors for uh, our events of today. And I just would like to go down that list very quickly um, and uh, then um, sort of thank a few people and leave um, the stage. Uh, so, uh, our, this is co-sponsored by the, uh, uh, the Andrea Mitchell Center for the Study of Democracy, the Annenberg School of Communications, the Departments of Anthropology, History, and South Asia Studies, the Center for the Advanced Study of India, South Asia Center, and where we are right now physically, the Kislak Center for Special Collections, Rare Books, and Manuscripts. And also this, is, this event would be impossible uh, to have had happen without the truly amazing staff of the Wolf Center. Um, and uh, I will, this includes by just the names are Sarah Varney, Sarah Milinski, Pamela Horn, Dina Janibekova, and, uh, and of course the primary organizers of this event are our postdocs and our grad students, um, our grad fellows I mean. And uh, among them, the one I'm going to name is Ishani Dasgupta, who is the moving force behind today's event. Okay, thank you, Professor Elias, for those very kind words. Um, thank you and uh, welcome to all of you to our keynote event, Ami Vida, an artist talk by Kukuli Valade, followed by a discussion with art historian and curator, Dr. Gwendolyn Dubois Shaw. Um, just a short introduction. Uh, Kukuli Valadre is a Peruvian artist based in the United States. She has received prestigious awards such as the Guggenheim Fellowship, the Paula Krasner Foundation Grant, the United States Artists Night Fellowship, and the Pew Fellowship in Visual Arts, amongst many others. She has also received the grand, grand prize at Gyeonggi, a ceramic biennialian in South Korea for her pro project Corpus. Kukuli Valadre has showcased her art in exhibition both in the United States and internationally. Her layered, at times humorous, at times ironic, but always powerful body of work touches on ideas of longing and remembering and on the spirit of defiance and creation. It captures her experience of being an immigrant in the United States, of being from a country wounded by colonialism, and of being from a country with a rich and defiant indigenous past, it captures the experience of motherhood. So, but before I hand it over to Kukuli uh, to showcase her art and take us through her experience as an artist and an immigrant, let me just give a short introduction to Dr. Gwendolyn Dubois Shaw, who will be in conversation with Kukuli after a presentation. Dr. Dubois Shaw is the class of 1940 bicentennial term associate professor of art history at the University of Pennsylvania. She's also an affiliated faculty in the Latin American and Latino studies and in the gender sexuality and women's studies program. She has been the senior historian at the Smithsonian National Portrait Gallery. Her curatorial work includes exhibitions at the Philadelphia Museum of Art, the Institute of Contemporary Art in Philadelphia, the Addison Gallery of American Art, amongst many others. She has partnered with numerous art institutions across United States to develop and implement exhibitions, public programs, and other scholarly events. And I'm thrilled to have both of you in conversation for our keynote event. 
Uh, so now without further ado, I'll hand it over to you. Um, I want to thank the Wolf Humanity Center at the University of Pennsylvania for inviting me as a keynote speaker for this symposium, Migration Points of Entry, Points of Departure. I am truly honored to be here with you all. I want to begin by acknowledging the Lenape people on whose territory we are, even though acknowledging them is in a way an empty gesture. We all are the unending migration wave that pushed them off. And the fact that cultural and political institutions in the city are not in any process to return the lands, or at least recognize their existence in the history books our children read, makes my naming them kind of superficial. I am an immigrant. And I don't know why I came to the United States or perhaps the reasons for which I did are so mundane and exempt of drama that I am a bit ashamed to be among those who had options and just pulled a straw and took a plane. I had a solo exhibition around 1983 and made some money. My heart was broken for the first time and my cousin was about to visit her family in Mexico. I went along and stayed two years as an art student, just because it seemed a good idea. I was, after all, free for the first time from my parents' supervision. They couldn't help me economically, so I lived those two years with the minimum possible. $142 a month paid a room and some food once in a while. It was exhilarating. I got my heart broken for the second time. He was pretty good looking. Um, and a friend and I decided to come to the States. I had a thousand dollars left and my mother saved enough to give me two more. We could have gone anywhere, but I knew a family in New York that offered housing. We came. I didn't mean to stay, but freedom had such an addictive flavor. And so I made my exodus official. I decided to get a bachelor's degree. My life began to take shape away from home. Friends appeared, history was built, was being built. I have made in this country a life of my own and I love the United States. But at 25, I didn't have any understanding of what it means to be an immigrant and what I left behind. My heart is permanently split between two worlds, my daughter and husband in the US, my mother, my family in Peru. Every time I travel to hold one more time my mother's delicate frame, my heart aches for my daughter and our afternoons of playing, conversing, being us. She's still a child. And as you know, childhood is so brief. To be an immigrant is to be always yearning, never fully one, no more. I am a Peruvian born American citizen. Five centuries ago, a handful of European men changed forever the course of history of the territory we know as Peru through a violent encounter. My work has frequently revolved around the consequences of this encounter and the ramification it carries of the imposition of one culture over another. I try to imagine the life-changing experience that the colonized endured, but it's always challenging to summon the scope of a collapsing of a universe. I was born in Cusco, formerly capital of the Inca empire and later a strategic power center of the colonial era. At the time of conquest, Sober palaces and temples of Inca manufacture were destroyed or 
reused as foundation of alien architecture. An unnerving physical example of victory and defeat. Their precious contents were melted if gold, burned if its nature was religious, or kidnapped if deemed rare, but beautiful. But Inca, a young colonizing power in itself intersected by the Spanish at its expansion period, was one of many nations that inhabited the land then and before, going back to more than 3,200 years before Christ. Each society shared general aesthetics attributes, but developed distinctively in various fields. While growing up, such an amalgam shaped my taste, including the presence of Catholic exuberance. Within the rich evolution of ceramic pottery throughout the territory, the type of vessels, representations, decorative designs, and the use of color were all means of communication with their own particular syntaxes. I have carried out a visual investigation of their attributes for decades to communicate contemporary history through ancient patterns and iconography, pointing out social, political, and economical conditions endured by current societies of colonized territories. My last works have tackled the survival of pre-Columbian sacred entities through Catholic imagery, embodying the forced marriage of colonial Spanish and pre-Columbian aesthetics as metaphor of cultural imposition and resistance. I see my work as an act of offering respect and a symbolic effort of acknowledging the existence of something else beyond what meets my westernized gaze. I am a studio artist. Lately, I took the challenge to create a course I have titled, Can We Decolonize Our Aesthetics? And I'm teaching it for the first time at Tyler School of Art and at MITA, an opportunity I'm grateful for. I have stepped out of my safe place, my comfort zone, my studio, to reach young artists in the making and question together this very culture we live, in where we rank everything, even creativity, where injustice is normalized and apathy or privilege maintain an unbearable status quo for many. I think we all, and Western and Westernized artists particularly, should see ourselves within a broader landscape than our immediate reality. Give ourselves a moment to pause and analyze our process from a contemporary historical background. Our first class project has been the understanding of cultural appropriation, reading about the doctrine of discovery and about the Moche culture from which they are reproducing Waco portraits with the inclusion of their faces in it as explorative exercises of the meaning of exchange, cultural appropriation and assimilation. It is a difficult process for we are wired to source and develop, to take and improve. And the possibility of such approach is not part of this exercise. By the way, <clears throat> I am among, among those who believe everyone has art in their hands. Once upon many times past, people let their imagination fly and their hands would follow its path creating as gods, universes of their own. Wars came and went and numerous aesthetics faded as they didn't conform to the paradigm coined 
by the victorious of the moment. But when Western culture took over, it reduced almost anything its elite didn't produce itself into subcategorizations such as crafts, souvenirs, or sources for their inspiration. The art produced beyond its peri perimeters were reduced to cultural anecdotes irrelevant to its superior aesthetics. Art, the big word, is reserved to an elite which has managed to create a storyline of evolution and development to which the rest of the world are only witnesses or followers if able. Hierarchies within art are also defined. Fine art schools implemented <clears throat> art theory written tirelessly in thousands of pages of too much self-awareness. And then people like my students at Fleischer Art Memorial repeat like many other phrases like, I don't know how to draw or I don't have a story to tell because those phrases are imprinted in all our minds and we believe them. Art has become this special unattainable thing that people can look at from far away, a language too sophisticated to use. But art is the process of letting imagination fly and be followed by hands that make creating universes of their own. And they, my senior Spanish speaking students, they can create and they do. Art, it is not an adjective, neither a qualification. It's an aesthetic declaration, a labor of love to challenge and please ourselves, our own sense of beauty. And it's a mirror of societies and their builders should be able to see themselves in it without consider considering their sense of beauty insignificant. The nature of what was going to be my creative work became apparent in 1981, when the Western world was preparing to celebrate the 500th anniversary of the beginning of European invasion led by Christopher Columbus. I was outraged. I couldn't believe the genocide of millions was swept under the carpet of modernity a small sacrifice to ignore compared to the benefits of colonization. I understood the dynamic and have since commented on it through my work from a very emotional point of view. I have never had to formulate in words what my artwork could do much more easily and hopefully on target. But now, there I am at the classrooms of both universities and here now in front of you, trying to convey myself in words. I'm not an academic, but I understand the wealth of information the habit of reading provides. And through some random readings within the vast research of Aníbal Quijano, Maria Lugones, Walter Mignolo, Santiago Castro Gomez, among many, I'm finding a way to talk to my students because to speak just with a heart is a disadvantageous point of departure within an educated Western society that gives more credit to words than feelings, particularly when they are considered immiscible. I found, for instance, the philosopher Emmanuel Chukwudi Etze, who in his book, The Color of Reason, The Idea of Race in Kant's Anthropology, uncovers the genesis of Western purist philosophical ideas in the Eurocentric and provincial points of view of Emmanuel Kant. Chugwudi Etze explains that a respected philosopher's preoccupation can be summarized as a sympathetic study of European humanity taken as humanity in itself. Humanity contrasted with a servile mentality lazy attitudes, barbaric demeanor, and inability to excel of the others. Permanently and 
in quotations rightfully, placed in the background of Western history. Kant's geographical and anthropological research is a demonstration of how this ideal or true humanity and its history is naturally, qualitatively, and quantitatively superior to all. Someone could say that Kant's racial assumptions are anecdotal or insignificant in comparison to his legacy, or that Chowoody has a bias, but I can't help to feel that the enlightenment, enlightenment, my pronunciation is, oh, okay, you know what I'm talking about, period was the moment to solidify Europe's path towards cultural imperialism and a thoughtful justification of colonization. It reminds me of the persistent mistaken perception of purity in the marble white classical sculptures of the ancient Greeks and Romans, which alleged sophisticated white surfaces have for centuries inspired Western aesthetics, allow, allowing it to set itself in contrast and above the barbarism of color. But they all were actually painted how intensely saturated were their surfaces can't be known, but their makers and their audience were not alien to the pleasure of color. To think that Gute declared that savage nations and educated people and children have a great predilections for vivid colors and that people of refinement avoid them because they are, well, refined, my goodness, I'm sorry, Gute, the paradigm was mistaken. Kant was wrong and so were you. But we are in a historical moment that may be transcendental or just a trend. The idea of writing historical wrongs has taken the foreground. The concept of the colonization is on many people's lips. I attended an interesting event organized days ago by the American Academy of Rome about missionary collections and museums. The question that lingered and answered by the participants was if there is a museum that has actually been successful in the colonizing their collection. I wrote a comment question that didn't get presented. It was, how about we decolonize museums by exchanging parts of the collections? If you want to keep objects that belong to others, how about you give them some that belong to you? I want some Velasquez and Picassos, some Jasper Jones and a few Rubens to belong to the permanent collections of museums in Africa, Latin America and Asia. Why not? Right? I said this 20 years ago in a university and everybody laughed hysterically. They saw it was very funny. I am funny, but I, was, I wasn't trying to be funny at that moment. But the idea of exchange is almost, you know, it's not thought through at all. I'm sorry, I'm getting off my very nicely written page. Uh, where I was. Let's get a plain even. It's not a matter of words and a token exhibit of an artist of color. Let's make the moment truly transcendental. It might, uh, it might have felt like I digressed, but colonization is an immigration issue. Many comers seeking a future lured by the promise of the American dream are coming, escaping territories with a history of colonization. They are the ones often intercepted at the entrance, their brown and black bodies rejected, while prestigious museums hold and possess the wealth that their hands were able to make when their universe was actually theirs. In 2018, I began a series titled A Mi Vida, To My Vida or To My Life. Each piece in this body of work carries my daughter's face when she was six. I got pregnant at 48. Yes, I did. I waited for the right moment. 
I got pregnant at 48 and gave birth to a child we named Vida. She has added to my life experience and fed my work in ways I have never expected. The idea of creating these intimate works sprouted from my surrendering to parental love and resignation to the emotions pain that to the emotional pain that will come when her world shifts away from ours when she grows up. I may have tons of photos of her, but once she's gone to follow her path, my arms will be left empty. I give myself through the pieces a chance to embrace her always one more time, if only to her effigy. But Amivida is not just about a mother and a natural and unavoidable separation from her offspring and the feelings that process provokes. The pieces speak of that emotional pain, the pain of separation, including one that is not natural, it's avoidable and it's unbearable. The project explores separations within the frame of our political landscape, the pain, a thousand times greater that must overcome a parent and a child when separated by force. The project aimed to raise awareness about the difficult times immigrants of color are facing still today from the perspective of an emotional bond abruptly torn. Each piece aims to become a symbolic representation of every immigrant child who was out there isolated and scared, trapped in federal detention centers throughout the country. They are deprived of all demonstration of love and sense of safety and remain betrayed by our society, which fails to embrace them and claim for their lives. The last numbers show that more than 2,100 children separated at border have not yet been reun re reunified. And only seven children have rejoined their family, their families since Biden took office. Also, accordingly to the Washington Post, a year into his presidency, the Democratic president has kept some of Trump's worst immigration policies in place. Amivida is a denunciation of the outrageous treatment of innocent life, and it's an urgent request for empathy and protection against the pain of imposed separation. My terracotta pieces of pre-Columbian inspiration are meant to symbolize immigrant children, for I am an immigrant, a minority with a child in my arms who can't understand the cruelty of separating families amidst of a political and social environment that has become every day more toxic and unsafe. The pre-Columbian connotation implies the connection that exists between people like me, westernized individuals from Latin America, and the land we left behind, where civilizations of varied cultural achievements and refined aesthetic developments are part of our history the history we share alongside original communities who maintain firsthand connection with our non-Western cultural heritage while stubbornly survive 500 years of genocide, perpetrated both through European colonization and Republic. This connection is often overlooked, assuming immigrants of color empty-handed newcomers ahistoric and incapable of any contribution and therefore underserving to become part of the cultural tapestry we imagine the United States is. The pieces aim to contribute somewhat to invest the Latin American immigrant presence with a cultural stand, hinting to the past present that is part of our mix as anyone else's. I should add, Amivida is also a performance, 
Each piece has been made to be carried by a mother's arms. They don't belong to pedestals. Their ideal presentation state is within your embrace. They are heavy, delicate, and valuable as the life of, mm. as the life of any child should be for all of us. Thank you for listening to me. So thank you, Kukuli. It's, um, it's my pleasure to be here in conversation with you. And um, uh, I'll just I'll, I'll say to everybody, uh, we, we only met a few weeks ago for the first time. I've been familiar with, um, uh, with your work for a while and it was great to finally have the opportunity to begin to talk with you about your practice. And I think maybe that's a good place to start to talk about the making and um, and the media and materials, because in the presentation, we've seen um, a variety of ways that you work. Um, and so maybe you could talk a little bit about um, the way that, uh, that, that making has, has changed for you, the different media that you have worked in. Um, and, uh, and, and then maybe if we could talk about working with clay and ceramic and earth, um, and um, uh, the, the manual aspect um, of that? Sure. Um, I, I was a prodigious child, uh, meaning that I was doing artwork since um, I was uh, very young. My first exhibition was at 10. And I had one exhibition per year until 21, 22. Yesterday, my mother got upset because she found out that I don't put those exhibitions in my resume. <laughs> and I'm like, mom, I'm 59. <laughs> um, so my resume begins from the United States, uh, my experience in the United States. And um, I used to paint. Um, I, I began drawing when I was three and my parents who, you know, their generation never pay attention, never paid attention to children. I hope that my reading was clear. Um, they pay attention to me because I was, you know, I was doing something unusual and then um, they were both journalists. They had a lot of papers and I was always drawing. But my, my father got so enthusiastic about um, me being a, an artist because he always wanted to be one. And uh, he felt that I, that he was gonna live his dreams through me, which uh, probably at this time you would think that is a horrible, terrible thing to do, to live your dreams through your children. Uh, but, um, you know, that was the way it was. And, and he, uh, he would say that I was his hands, for example. So when I left uh, Peru, and I came to the United States and I, I came to New York. I went to New York. Um, I thought that I was gonna study painting in the university, but a uh, professor uh, painting, I, I, I didn't like him. And um, I tried ceramics and I have, uh, I have been raised looking at ceramic um, is, is, is part of our, um, uh, inheritance, if, if we can, our visual inheritance. And um, I hated the first semester of ceramics because they wanted me to do certain things that I, 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 you know, I'm not used to think about cups for making cups for, for drinking. That's not the kind of ceramics I saw in Peru. The ceramics that you see in Peru are the ones that are in those showcased nicely so and coffee mugs and ashtrays weren't the thing you were looking to no i wasn't stand into i i made a point in not making the bottom of the pieces so they were not functional uh -huh. um i regret now that's how it but you know so um my 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 approach to ceramics um is 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 from visual memory um 
And um, it's interesting because I went to that, uh, that Korean uh, Biennale in, 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 in Korea, <laughs> in Cheon. And, uh, and there was uh, um, an artist from, from Taiwan that was talking about clay. And, uh, and he was um, caressing a piece of clay and throwing it to the, to the floor and picking it up. And it was extending on the floor. It was very rhythmical. And I, you know, I talked to him afterwards and my relationship with clay is not at all like that. I'm very westernized in, in that sense. I, I, uh, um, I approach clay as I approach oil painting and canvases as a possibility of, of talking about something that interested me. So I, I don't have, um, I don't have that kind of, of of um, of closeness to the material, my 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 closeness is to 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 those things that I've seen and I aesthetically enjoy, and and I think are part of, of my heritage. So I I began working with with clay. My father didn't like it at all. He was like, "You're wasting your time," and so on, so on. And uh, he would always tell me every year that I went paint. Pinta, pinta, carajo, he would say. And, uh, and, and I just didn't feel like painting until, until uh, 2004, that uh, all of a sudden came the idea about doing these self-portraits and seeing myself age, because I saw that at 40, 43, uh, I was uh, old, which, you know, now it seems so silly. <laughs> And um, I began doing these paintings, and my father was in a, at a hospital waiting for a heart surgery. And I took the photographs of the paintings, and, and he was very happy that I was finally doing what he thought I should be doing on all, all, all this time. And um, you know, I, I'm glad that he was able to to see it because he died after that um, surgery. So that is my relationship to both uh, materials. Um, mm -hmm. You know, talking about this idea of um, that you have with the class this semester, oh, yeah. um, with you know decolonizing one one's aesthetics. Yeah, as a question. As a question, you know, is it possible, yeah. right? And you know, thinking about your relationship with your father and his kind of understanding of the value of painting yeah. versus the value of um, you know working with clay and ceramics. Um, do you think like, you know, coming from Cusco, for example, there's a, you know, a rich tradition of painting and of, you know, painting particularly like uh, the Virgin of the Andes, yeah. for example. And if one goes there, you know, today you can, you know, it, it, for, for tourist images, you know, you can buy these canvases for, you know, 30 or $40 and, you know, roll it up and bring it home, and, you know, and get it framed. And there's a sense that this is, um, a, a, a traditional, um, you know, form that goes back five or 600 years, right? Um, and if we think about the way that we value certain media and materials um, as, um, you know, as being part of a cultural tradition, um, were there connections like that in your family, in the, um, uh, you know, in Cusco, in terms of what was valued? Um, culturally regarding different kinds of art making? Well, my, my parents uh, are what you would call uh, very chauvinistic uh, in terms of Cusco uh, and Peru. Um, and and they, they had a reason to be in a way, uh, it's not a justification, but an explanation. When they came from Cusco to Lima in the 50s, in the late 50s, uh, Lima was an island that was uh, living, looking towards Europe and the United States. And they had absolutely no interest in what was happening in the rest of Peru. And my, my parents um, were, the, were among the very first ones who began writing about it. Mm -hmm. So they have an appreciation of, of Peruvian culture that, that is a, a little bit um, extreme. 
But in the case of, of my father, um, he uh, had this romantic idea of, you know, of me painting like Caravaggio or Rubens and, 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 and that kind of thing, because you are fed with the idea that this is what art is or is supposed to be. And um, the, the possibility of, of uh, looking at our, at, at, at a more, to a, to a aesthetic that, that actually belong to the land much stronger was not his preoccupation. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think he had a very romantic idea of what uh, Peru, Peru was. And I think that at the time in which they were active, uh, there were not too many possibilities uh, to embrace the country if it were not through that romanticism. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I explained answer your question. Yeah, no, 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 I, 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 I understand what you're saying. And then, you know, here you coming, right, um, for love to the United States for the opportunity to come um, and then pursuing a career, you know, pursuing the bachelor's degree, studying art and choosing um, a media, choosing form and choosing um, subject matter, right? And then the subject matter changing over time as one grows and ages and has different life experiences. So thinking about both the um, uh, uh, kind of the migration of form, but also the migration of aesthetics, right? So have your aesthetics changed over the years? Like, do you see um, as you've moved physically that the things that you valued aesthetically have those moved with you? Have they changed? Do you engage them in different ways, depending on, you know, if you're in a Peruvian context you know, or in a Philadelphian one? The, the, the decision of creating for me is, is not cerebral. In other words, I don't, I don't plan a strategy of creation, mm -hmm. I I don't uh, go and 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 coldly decide I'm gonna do this and I'm gonna use these elements because these elements are I I work uh, the way I work and maybe it's, it's weird or, or or stupid but it's um I cannot help it so any impulsive it's it's compulsive I cannot help it I I have to and. Um, and I think that uh, I, if there are fine art students here uh, or artists, uh, um, I think that 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 you know, you, in 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 very simple way, you could say is is you're involved by the passion of making. So I'm not I I'm not interested in 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 looking at myself critically and, and decide in the processes or stages in which the work goes, even though I can see that there's a, a change uh, in it, I, I, I rely a lot in, in my pre-Columbian uh, experience um, because aesthetically um, I cannot see other, I don't feel any other way to talk through my work than, than with this element. Is um is unavoidable. So when I began working and I made my first uh, series with the colonized ones, and I was I still in the university, I didn't know how to work with clay, and and they were cracking, and they were, uh, you know, and and I love the cracks because they it, it augmented the message, and I was really a rage because they were celebrating this, and even in 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 Latin America, there were these big celebrations uh, planned, and 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 I I just couldn't stand it. It's not my brain who decided. It's just that I couldn't stand it. And, uh, and after this came other things. And, th and then I had years in which I didn't create anything because I just couldn't uh, I tune myself to, to anything in particular. And then I was just doing videos and doing other stuff. And then for example, after a few years, I thought, why would, what would these ceramic pieces in the Metropolitan Museum, museum think 
if they come to life. And then all of a sudden they are in a showcase and, and with this beautiful light and all these people looking at them and they were supposed to be buried and they were supposed to have a different end. What would they do? And I imagine that some of them would be outraged. Some of them would be like, I don't give a damn. Some of them would be uh, scared. And, and so I, 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 I came with a title, Plunder Me Baby, which I didn't know it has a sexual connotation. Now I'm glad. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and Plunder Me Baby uh, came to be. And all these pieces of that series are looking back to the... They are all looking back at a viewer and wondering, what the hell are you? Who, who are you? And, uh, and, and that was not planned either. You know, it's, it's like you go to these museums and you feel like, you know, all of this has been kidnapped one way or another. These collections have come from, from, from um, these collections in the museums belong to private collections that have acquired the material, no matter how much it costs, they just pay. And then, you know, tombs are opened and nobody is in fault and all of a sudden appears and they don't know when and so on. You, you know that so, so well. And so anyway, um, these are things that, that really bother me and, and that's why I was saying, you know, I'm I'm more I'm I'm emotional artist. I'm not a rational one. Well, but to think about the you know the emotions of the objects, right? This you know I, I love this idea of the the objects coming to life. When I was uh, a, a little kid, I, I one of the museums that I went to as a child was the Peabody Museum at Harvard which is an anthropology museum similar to the Penn Museum in, you know, in a lot of ways. And the very first nightmare that I ever had was of being locked in the museum overnight and having the, um, the totem poles and, and, <laughs> and objects come to life, you oh. know, because you know, I, I guess I could sense the power that was within them, right? And that there, um, that there was a, a kind of animated possibility there. You know, and so seeing um, these ceramic pieces being sentient, right? Having um, a consciousness that, um, uh, you know, that we can see expressed in their uh, faces in their hands and the movement of the bodies, um, I think is, you know, is very powerful. And there's something about that um, that happens, especially because they're three-dimensional right? That they occupy our space in a different way than the flat canvas does, than, you know, even uh, a, a painted portrait or something that looks back at us and, you know, seems self-aware is very different than what you get with the uh, three-dimensional ceramic sculpture. Yeah. Yeah. No, painting is a different responsibility. Uh, ceramic is not going to wait for you you have to take decisions. Painting is, is a very um, sadistic because it's just waiting, you know, it's there in the canvas waiting for you and you can wait for years and, and, and nothing's gonna happen. With the ceramic piece, there's this immediate, immediateness that, mm -hmm. that has to, that you have to do something, you have to resolve it. Yeah. And uh, I think that in that way, uh, Clay gave me a freedom that painting didn't painting was always a responsibility, and I think that even now in a in a art school, the ceramic department is is a little lighter because I think that maybe they you know have a, a that immediacy that that the painting department is, is suffering with, um, or you know, because painting is tough. Mm. Well, and with ceramics, you can. While the clay is wet, you can still add back in and build up and, and then remove and add back. And then can break in the, in the firing. Yeah, if, if you don't do it don't fast do, enough. You know, everybody has their pros and cons. <laughs> yeah. The, um, you know, thinking about teaching, right? And um, working with uh, younger students, I, I loved in the presentation, the way that you contrasted you know, what it is to work with students at Micah or Tyler um, with working at the Fleischer 
Yeah. You know, and how working with students of different ages. Um, and, uh, and, and so I was hoping you could talk a little bit about those, um, those engagements and um, uh, the way that you think about approaching the- You're gonna get me in trouble. <laughs> oh no, <laughs> only things you want to say. No, no, it's, it's fine. Um, I, I think that uh, the, the wonderful thing about working with seniors, um, this uh, class, I, uh, I had this group of people for I think two or three years and we did a lot of stuff is that they came with the idea that they cannot do art. And when you have the idea that you cannot do art, anything, uh, you know, you're willing to do, to try anything. And as you might have seen in the, in the, in the photographs, we even made a book. They all uh, did a story with images of, uh, of uh, COVID and how it has affected them. And uh, Fletcher has, uh, uh, has the book, is available. And, uh, and, and with that freedom, um, once they were convinced that they could make art, then you know, the sky's the limit. They made very big pieces. Uh, they were not afraid. Um, they didn't. They they, they don't. Uh, they are not afraid of size or they are not afraid of anything because they are just. Um, they are being allowed to to create, to do what we all can do. Um, none of them had. A, none of them no. Uh, Obed San Martin. He 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 has been doing art for a long time, but. Uh, many of them didn't have any 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 art uh, background. Um, a student a, a student in in a university is is coming with certain ideas of what is art making, and then it it, it encounters the ideas of of the institution of what is art making. And one of the things that I'm trying to do with my students is to talk about, uh, besides you know, cultural appropriation and, and all these things, uh, uh, talking about the possibilities of being an artist in much more than one way, my, beyond the, the, the white box. And um, I, I think that this is, is important to, for them to understand that creativity is a right. And, uh, and it's something that you don't generally uh, learn in a university um, at all. You know, there are uh, hundreds or thousands of uh, people who leave uh, uh, the university after, a master, after obtaining a master's degree and don't do art uh, anymore because also they have the idea art has to be made in this way. And, and perhaps if, if they had being told that there, there is more freedom than that, they would still be making art. And then we have an idea of what is success and what is failure. And to me, the only failure is um, when you are not happy making what you want to do. So um, it's interesting to me to work with these different groups. Um, I don't have too much experience. I have taught in universities uh, very rarely. Um, I don't have a master's degree, so I cannot uh, expect to be part of a, of a faculty body, but, but I think that there are, certain, um, there are certain problems with education of students in the arts. Um, they, are, they are told that there's one history of art. Um, my students who are not uh, Euro-Americans, are, um, don't see themselves in the art history books, or if they see, you know, a, a Chinese student may see only one chapter of Asian art in the art history book and representation matters. So uh, from the beginning, they are completely lied to, you know, in terms of the history of creativity. And, um, and then if they are coming from different uh, aesthetics and different backgrounds, they are told that they have to forget everything and, and become a copy. And I hate that. You know, I, I had a, a student once, um, because I, I go to universities to give talks and there was a student, I don't remember, it was Persian. I don't remember, uh, but he was uh, around that, that area. And 
And he was telling me uh, that um, he loves symmetry, but that the, the professors have told him that he had to, to, to break it, to be asymmetrical. And, and he was showing me the work and he was like, you know, but symmetry is, in, is part of my culture. And, uh, and I said, so do it. And, and, and he was like, no, but my professors are gonna say that, uh, you know, that uh, they are not gonna like it and say, and I was like, you know, tell them that you don't give them what they think <laughs> or, or, or not, because what they are trying to do is to convert you in someone that you are not. And the uniqueness of, you, of the way you look at things and that the way that you create is gonna get completely erased and you're gonna be one of many. You know, why do they want to make you one of many? I don't, I don't understand. So I, that is the experience I have with universities, going, talking to students, and, uh, and, and finding out how sometimes uh, they are um, forced to, to become some, someone else. It's weird. It is. It, it's, it's um, you know, the, the challenge between um, assimilation yes. and, um, uh, assimilation, exactly. uh, you know, in education, right? And, and what is the difference when, uh, you know, certain ideologies, ideologies of form, aesthetic, et cetera, you know, are being, um, you know, superimposed and, you know, imposed upon, upon people. You know, I, I think with the, um, you know, going back to the Amivida, series and the way that in, in that series, I just want to talk about that. And then I'd, I'd love to open up for questions from the audience um, that in, in that series, you're bringing together all of these different nodes, right? There's this kind of personal relationship with your daughter that you're working through. Um, there's a material relationship with um, the, uh, uh, the artistic sources that you're drawing upon with the, you know, ceramic traditions that you're working visually within and, and changing. Um, and then there are these political aspects to it. Um, and, you know, just over the last couple of days, it's been really, you know, challenging, I think for, for me watching the, you know, the forced exodus of, people leaving their families in Ukraine, yeah. right? But this is something that we've been watching for years at the Southern border. Um, you know, families being torn apart, fleeing. Um, and these differences between, you know, when we think about migration um, and who gets to be, you know, or who is assigned to different categories of migrant or refugee or expatriate, right? Um, you know, and, and, and what propels people to leave and how then does one, um, uh, you know, think about, um, uh, you know, the choice to leave and, and the risk to lose, right? Yeah. The risk to lose your, your baby at, at the border, yeah. trying to save them. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, and, and to be able to encapsulate all of these different aspects into these objects, um, you know, it's, it's such a powerful series. Um, and it, it seems to me that it's one that, um, you know, can only come in some ways in an artistic practice after a journey, right? That you have to, in some ways, have, um, you know, have, have, have time and space behind to create like that. I mean, it, it's, it's, I find it, a, it, it's both very topical and in the now, but it's also a series that carries with it this tremendous history. Yes. 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 Yeah. The, um, uh, mi vida is, um, is just the, the imagination of why would it be if somebody takes away my daughter from my arms? And I, I think that that is a pain that all mothers or caregivers should identify with. It's, um, I, I always tell my husband, uh, for you, I'm, I, I'm willing to die, but for my daughter, I'm willing to kill. 
and uh, and just the idea of of something uh, happening uh, to her and not knowing where she is um, i cannot imagine how how anybody can allow such a cruelty to happen um i I've, I've been witness of of um of injustice uh, from very early in my in my life, um, the 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 people who help you in your house in in Peru because in in Peru, the middle class, the upper middle class, the the others that are up there and lower middle class, everybody has a maid, and the maid uh, has to live in the house and uh, is given the a very small room that um, architects keep um, designing even now the most, uh, in, the greatest architects in, in Lima will make a house in which the house of the maid is always gonna, the, I'm sorry, the, the, the bedroom, it's always gonna be small. When you in reality don't have any reason to do that, is that the, 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 question, the question of keeping hierarchy and um, and the maid in, in, in my house, I remember uh, sitting on the floor because couldn't sit in the chair to look at the soap opera, you know, to the, and it, it, it always seemed to me so, so strange. And, and then uh, I remember once uh, going to see a festivity with my parents in which there were some dancers who were speaking Quechua among each other. And I asked my nanny, uh, what are they saying? And, and she turned to me and she was very angry. <clears throat> and she said, I don't speak Quechua. And I know she's, you know, that she spoke Quechua. And it was also shocking to me. So all these small things that, that many, many choose not to pay attention to. That is still are happening. Um, like a, like a going in a taxi with my husband and the taxi driver telling me, um, I, I would have taken your husband anywhere he wanted, even if he didn't have money. And when I asked him if he would have done the same thing for me, he looked at me through the mirror and says, no man. And, um, and, now I, and I know that he's looking at him as a tourist and he's trying to be nice with him, but then all the tourists of color would never have opportunity to have a free ride with that guy. And, and that mentality, you know, that's the mentality of the colonized who, who, who think that the, the white is superior and, and, and won't say it in those words. And, but it is, and, and, and the fact that, that people are, are um, that we are willing to treat people who come to work in the houses, giving them the worst room, uh, different food than the, in many houses, different food than, than what a family eats. And it is, is, is just a, con, a contemptuous um, way of treating ourselves. You know, it's it's a self it's self hatred, and 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 it, these things began to be in your head, and, and and you wonder how much am I part of this, and and then you come to the United States, and you know you 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 find a different way of racism, and um, and and things became clear. You know, as soon as you leave the the. The aquarium. Um, you realize how 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 dirty it is, <laughs> or or you know how it is. So I think that those those are the experiences that that have. Uh, maybe I just chose to to notice. Thank you. Um, do we have questions? No kidding. There's a question. Yeah. <laughs> I feel important. Is the, the sound, you can hear the sound? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Muchas gracias por su obra y sus palabras. Um, I was very taken by your, um, your, you started by discussing the way that your life is separated. It's in two different places maybe in many different places. And I've been um, 
in a, many discussions recently about the restitution of different kinds of objects to the African continent. And some of these discussions are exactly about the inhabitation of multiple places by an object. And I kept thinking as I was looking at your many wonderful artworks about how they might inhabit multiple places and what it means for an object a, a, an object to be a displaced object and to have been brought into being as a displaced object. I don't know if you think this way at all about your work, but I was wondering if this is something that you've been... No, when, you know, when, when talking about an object that is displaced, I, I can't help to think about the collections uh, in the Metropolitan Museum and going to the museum and having a coffee at the corner in the deli you know, in the bodega or the deli, I don't know how, um, before going to the museum. And the, the people who are making your coffee are the, the same Mexicans <laughs> who made those pieces that are in the museum that they will never go to see. And there's a complete disconnection that we always do between those things that we, we, we consider valuable and those life that we don't consider valuable. In, in terms of my work, I'm that the, the most important moment for a, a, the, the most important connection of an artist with a work is in the moment of making, in the moment that is successfully you know repaired if it broke, <laughs> which is what I'm doing now with one of my pieces. Uh, and and all that process of making uh, is 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 that connection. After that, um, I have I have seen the work in 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 situations uh, like you know like like in collections that will never uh, that nobody will ever see them again. Um, and I I just made peace with that because for me, the, the, the relationship is uh, unbreakable and the experience is uh, unforgettable. I, uh, I'm, I'm of, I, I am of the artists who quote unquote waste time making because I, I don't be, I have a, a theory. Um, um, I, I think that efficiency is, is uh, and it is, I'm against e efficiency <laughs> because why would you want to make faster what you can enjoy making longer? And uh, I remember I was making this piece and it, it has a, a neck and I was shaving the neck with a material with you know taking off clay and there was a moment in which it was getting too thin. And I was telling my husband, who is an artist too, and he has a master's degree. And I was telling him, you know, the the the, the neck is getting thinner. Uh, uh, I don't know what I'm gonna do. And he said, Well, why don't you just make another one, the size that you want, and you put it, you know, you cut it and you put it on. I said, No, you know, <laughs> I have already gave too much time shaving this neck. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take a slab, I'm gonna score it very well, I'm gonna score inside, and I'm gonna put it like this. And he was looking at me like, but you're gonna have bubbles. Well, we're gonna fire it very slow. And he's like, why are you gonna do that? Because those three, four more days that I had working in that, because I, I had to keep shaving, right? I had to get, were amazing. You know, I could have fixed it in, in one week, in, I'm sorry, in one day, maybe in half an hour, yes. But the, I, I enjoyed making my pieces and I work by myself so far. And, um, and that's something that nobody can take away from me. So um, is that the, the, the important connection with the work? After a while, you know, new pieces come, it's like love, you know. Can I, can I build on that just really, really quickly? Is it, is it different when you show your work here versus when you show it in Peru? Oh, I had an exhibition in Peru. 
And but no, it's not the same because when I had the same plant in my baby in Peru, um, people would come, people my age or older, would come um, with tears in their eyes. And, and, and a couple of times, not like a hundred people. <laughs> But you know, but the, the, the point was that they knew what I was talking about. They knew, you know. Here the work is seen more from aesthetic point of view. And, but there, 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 there was this, this connection. And I had a lot of people going to my exhibition because even though I'm 59, at that time I was 10 years younger, I was uh, 49, people remembered me because I, I, was, I was very popular when I was a kid. I, you know, I was a kid who painted and had exhibitions. So I was on TV and I had, um, you know, I, I knew all the TV people, they gave me bikes and, and uh, it, it was a beautiful life. Um, so people came to see me remembering the drawings that I did when I was a kid, which is crazy. And they found all this work that was completely different, but I got a lot of people, you know, more than, than a usual exhibition. So um, it, it is different because in Peru, they know what I'm talking about. And, and that also brings, that, brings up that, the situation that is, uh, I don't think I could make a career in, in Peru because they know what I'm talking about, if you know what I mean. It's a question over here. Hola, Kukuli. Que gusto verte de nuevo. Um, I have a question that would be some sort of a follow up on the question that you did regarding media, because you touch you 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 just talk about painting and play. But um, I know I knew that in the Amivida series is also a performance. And you mentioned briefly that you were doing videos in a certain time. So uh, what, what is your position, let's say, with these other two mediums? Or how do you expect, have you, have you done performances before? Do you, do you, is this something new, especially for this piece? Why did you need it or like uh, what? And I know that you just you, you have told us that you go just by heart and and you don't plan or is not is not a, 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 a like a, a design process. But do you feel a, a, there is some sort of, of hunch for you that you're going to go into the performance, for instance, or how how do you see these two other mediums? Um, if you can elaborate on that. Well, I, uh, uh, Amivira is performance because there was no other other way to convey what I wanted to convey. The pieces, the, the, the childlike pieces that you have seen, they are not to be placed on a pedestal. And actually, if you are interested, um, they are going to be shown for the first time at the Clay Studio this uh, March or April. April 22nd. April 22nd. Yes, and uh, and we are uh, we are doing a performance um, because the 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 right place for the pieces to be is in arms. Um, you know, I I think that the the, the work should should have the, the adequate way of being shown, and and arms is the way that those pieces should be shown. Unfortunately, you cannot get anybody to be carrying the piece for eight hours every day for an exhibition. So the pieces are going to be on strollers. And, uh, and we are going to do a performance um, in the first day at the opening, and we are going to be carrying it. And I'm going to be passing the pieces to you. And uh, that uh, to begin with, um, many, um, there is this idea that art, you should not touch. You look, but you don't touch, right? And um, I want to go against that. I, uh, you know, it took me a, a time to make them and all, but I think that what they represent is more valuable than themselves. So I'm, I'm, I'm trusting you in, uh, in you carrying the piece if, if, if for a few minutes, so that the, the. The metaphor of, 
of the carefulness and the weight and you know it's work work to carry something they are not too heavy but after five minutes believe me they are <laughs> but children are like that you know i carry my daughter everywhere for the first um, even when she was uh 49 because 50 i couldn't 49 pounds i would you know hold her on my body so um that the ideal is these pieces to belong to arms and for you to feel the, the weight of, of, uh, of, or the responsibility of life. Now they are just a metaphor. And um, I'm looking forward uh, for the opportunity that Clay Studio is giving me to show them and, and have this performance exactly as I thought. And the performance came up to be because um, there's no other way to convey completely what they, what they are supposed to mean if you don't carry them and if you don't take care of them. I don't know if that is, makes sense. Uh, so our online audience also has a few questions. Uh, maybe we'll take one more from the room and uh, if anyone has them, then we can go. Thank you for sharing your work and for a wonderful discussion. Um, as you know, I teach art history here at Penn and um, there are some of my students um, who are in the room or were in the room from a class that I'm co-teaching with a colleague, World Art 1400 to Now. And one of, I know, all right, that already should have. <laughs> Um, we, um, one of the things that we're doing, my colleague is a specialist in Italian Renaissance art, and I work on South Asia, uh, specialize in the modern period, but I think we're somewhere in the 16th century right now. Um, and the question um, I had for you is about a category that we have been discussing throughout um, as being historically, or I should say a relationship or a relation that we're uh, discussing throughout the class that's been historically constructed, which is one of art and craft. What does it mean? To produce art, what does it mean to produce craft? And um, I didn't, I don't, I'm not really, um, uh, what to say, I'm not forcing an academic discussion so much, but it seems to me that the word craft um, came up at the very beginning in terms of a kind of discourse around clay or ceramics that's often very uh, pejorative. But of course, much art produced uh, before the modern world was valued as, as techne, as hunar, as, um, as a skill, but also in some of the terms that you've described your own work, which is to say, care, devotion, um, uh, labor. Um, I, I really love the description of the, the work that was shaved and then you wanted more time with it. Um, and so I guess I wondered whether, um, you know, now there's even a subfield of art history that's called critical craft studies. So my question is really less about whether, you know, you see yourself in that field or whether, um, uh, you know, work is, um, uh, what's, I mean, there's a lot of work, scholarly work, but also, uh, you know, museum interest in textile arts, for example. Um, so I'm less interested in kind of, you know, how are museums or the market receiving this work, but do you yourself as an artist, in terms of your practice, have a relationship to the term craft, to reclaiming that category in any way? Or is it for you just this, um, the term that's used to in some ways denigrate uh, an entire sphere of cultural practice and, and peoples, I think, who, um, who make in those terms? Well, um, any answer that I can give you is completely uh, my own. <laughs> um, I, I never thought of the word craft in, 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 in any time period in my life. Um, I, I come from a painting background, and for me, whatever a person does is art. And there's art that is crafted, maybe, and art that is, you know, a concept only, and somebody else makes it, and, you know, everybody has the right to dance their tango in the way they want to dance it. And I, um, I'm tired of categorizations, and, and I, I'm, you know, I, I have a problem with art history in general. And, uh, and um, you know, the, the other day I saw a video um, by, unfortunately, this is an extraordinary Greek artist and uh, she made a video of, of the Australian women 
uh, making art. And uh, the fact that the, in the video, you see this, this woman telling her stories. And while she's telling her stories, she's uh, forming lines and, and, and shapes in the, in the dirt. And as she's talking, she keeps doing, moving, forming, creating. And when she finishes the story, that the drawings also are, you know, taken away, they disappear. And then um, the, the extraordinary government of Australia um, in all its goodness uh, has this um, initiative of, of creating a a small, uh, um, um, I don't know how you call it, small centers where people can have healthcare and can have art and so on. And uh, the person who is in charge of the art center uh, gives the women the idea that they can, instead of doing things in the sand, they can make it in a canvas and buy, I'm, I'm sorry, sell them and have money for getting things for the children and all that. And the women do it, you know, and in the moment that, 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 um, that, these, uh, that, that the people who put this together are like, you know, now they are gonna have the possibility to, to make money and, and feed the kids, which is extremely important, right? Uh, but in the very moment that that is happening, a culture is killed. You know, a way of looking is killed. A way of understanding aesthetics is killed. And, uh, and, and we always do that. So when we go and we look at art of other, other uh, cultures, we do the same. We apply the same things. We, we think that we are objective and we can understand everything and measure everything the same way. And I, it's always in my mind that, you know, that woman that which, which art will disappear and things keep disappearing. And, uh, and I don't know how much we need to know about others. Uh, definitely is not a benef benefiting, benefiting them, right? Uh, it's like archaeologists opening uh, comes and bringing the bones to the university and being like, oh, we have this coffin on 1,500 years old and and what, you know, that person was expecting to be buried and the person was expecting to have all those ceramic pieces around them and we don't give a damn. I hope that they open the, the tombs of the, of, uh, of the parents of Queen Elizabeth. Uh, I want to see their bones. You know, I want to see the bones of all those uh, Buckingham people. Um, and I want to see them showcased. Yeah, you know, let's play even. You know, uh, where is uh, Ronald Reagan's uh, bones? I want to see them. I'm sorry. <laughs> hi, uh, hi, Kukuli, gracias. Um, there are a couple of questions in the chat that I want to share with you. Really, you've already answered a couple of these, so I just want to acknowledge the questions themselves. One was about the if you had any plans for a performance of the series of um, Amibida, which you already talked about, and the other one that you've already, already addressed without knowing it is about the reception of these ideas that you've uh, shared with us today in Peru or in Latin America more broadly, which you already uh, also talked a little bit about. There's another question and um, uh, by Kate Purshariati in the chat, um, uh, who would like to know if there's any way that we could read the text of your talk once again, because it is beyond beautiful. And I want to use the question to kind of like elaborate a little bit on the re your own relation, or if you could talk a little bit about your own relation with writing, or as a as or also as an artistic practice, and specifically in the context of your uh, kind of approach to um, the, the the making of the work of art as some as something that is very much driven by uh, experience and feeling, as opposed to the more distanced sort of. 
act of interpretation that goes into putting those words into paper. Um, so I guess the, the the broader question or the way to, that I would like to rephrase this question for you is, is, is if you also engage in this practice of writing and reflection about your own work and if you have any 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 plans for that writing to to be made more broadly available oh no um <laughs> i wrote this and i was wondering my goodness does it make sense i read it to my husband like 10 times the poor thing um my parents both were writers and my, my father had a style that um, both of them have wonderful styles uh, from the 60s, 70s, kind of, uh, you know, very Baroque. And I, I, I like that, uh, that, that way of writing. And, and my father was very personal in his writing. And even now people remember him as a, a you know, as a very special person because he was very emotional too. And I guess I take it from him. Um, but I don't know, I don't think that I'm, you know, too clear writing, especially in English, my goodness, is, is a challenge. I did it myself, <laughs> but um, no, I, I, I write sometimes when something comes up, but you need too much discipline for being a writer. I'm, 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 I'm into procrastination most of the time, honestly. <laughs> But thank you, because maybe I should do something. So is there one more question? Hold on. What is Ah, about my daughter, yeah. Well, I, I draw it mostly. Yeah. I consider it. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, Julie, and thank all of you here tonight and um, online. Um, thank you so much. No, thank you.